Getting old is a pain in the arse literally in the case of Paul Sedgwick. He and his wife, Mary, had, over the years, built up a very successful, small property development company. He had started out on leaving school as an odd job man and had gradually grown his business, first into designing patios and garden rooms, then to full-blown extensions, and finally, once he had accumulated a bit of capital, new builds on small pockets of land he managed to find. As the business grew, Mary started to undertake the administrative side, finding potential new projects and managing the books. Neither Paul nor Mary was a particularly greedy person and so they never sought to overreach themselves, they were content to remain a highly respected, family firm. Unfortunately they never had children and therefore when, in their mid-fifties, a larger firm offered to buy them out, they passed on their business with few regrets, excited by the prospect, for the first time in their lives of having some time to enjoy themselves. Retirement, with a healthy nest egg, looked rosy. And so it proved for Mary. At age 60 she looked at least 10 years younger than her calendar age. She had retained her figure and, whilst she had inevitably gone up a dress size or so since her glory days, remained a stylish dresser who attracted admiring glances from men of a certain age. Paul, on the other hand, encountered one problem after another once he had stopped working. Years of toiling in all weathers, lifting and carrying, often working very long hours, had sapped his health. First he back gave out and he had to abandon the plans he had for taking up golf. Then arthritis attacked his knees and hips. Before long he was stooped and bent, shuffling around as he walked. By the time he reached 60, he looked at least 10 years older than he was. In fact he and Mary were of the same age, but he looked about 70, whilst she looked 50 if that. Whilst Paul had had to give up golf, and most of the other active pastimes he loved, Mary had continued to enjoy these sports and was a full, and active, member of the local golf club, tennis club, and had also taken up bridge. Her life was full and exciting whilst Paul's was increasingly becoming housebound. The difference in their appearance became very apparent to the couple when the received prints of the photos they had had taken to mark their ruby wedding anniversary. I look old enough to be your father, not your husband, grumbled Paul. You would be better off without me. Don't be silly, replied Mary, I love you too much to want to be rid of you just yet, but I do agree we need to think seriously about whether we can do anything about improving your health and appearance. Nothing more was said for a few days and then, one evening, Mary handed Paul a brochure she had been reading. I have been doing some research into age-related, degenerative conditions, she announced, and I have come across this clinic. The clinic in question advertised itself in specializing in health and retirement. I think you should make an appointment and go and talk to them, advised Mary. I have looked up some of their previous clients who have given testimonials on the web and it does seem as though they have had some pretty spectacular results. You have nothing to lose by going to talk to them. Paul had to agree with Mary and rang to make an appointment. A few days later he shuffled his way into the waiting room at the clinic and told the receptionist that he had an appointment with Alice Jones. Dr. Jones will be with you shortly, said the receptionist with a smile. Please take a seat. Paul collapsed into a chair and had to struggle to get to his feet when, a few minutes later, an attractive blonde lady came over and introduced herself as Dr. Alice Jones. She led him into her consulting room and sat him down. I can see already that you are in need of help, Alice started. Why don't you tell me about yourself and the type of symptoms you are experiencing? Paul spent the next 20 minutes or so outlining the difficulties he was having with mobility and explaining how his lifestyle over the previous 40 years had contributed to the problems he was now experiencing. Well the good news is that your situation is not unique, smiled Alice, when he had finished. We have had a number of clients come to us with similar issues and we have a good success rate of improving their quality of life. I think the next thing will be to give you a full examination. I should tell you that, as a clinic specializing in your type of condition, we have a wide range of medical and therapeutic skills at our disposal. Alice took Paul through to another room and introduced him to a nurse, Jenny, who would be carrying out the basic routine tests. 
For the next half hour, Paul submitted himself to a battery of tests, weight, height, blood and urine samples, lung capacity. He had never had such a thorough going over. Jenny then escorted him to another room where Sally, a physiotherapist, put his through a series of exercises and manipulations. When all the testing was complete, Paul put his clothes back on and returned to the waiting room where he was given a cup of coffee and told that his results would be ready in about half an hour. True to their word, barely half an hour had passed before Paul found himself being ushered back into Alice's office. I think we can help you, was her opening, welcome remark. Your general health is better than average for a man of your age, but you do have a very weak back and the onset of early arthritis in both your knees and hips. However, the major part of your problem, and the source of most of your pain, is that, in trying to compensate for problems in your back, knees and hips, your body has become distorted and your muscle mass is very much out of balance. I am going to prescribe a number of physiotherapy sessions with Sally to get your body back in alignment. You have also somewhat overweight and the loss of a few pounds would ease the strain on your joints. We have an appropriate dietary recommendation for you that I want you to start immediately. Paul thanked Dr. Jones profusely and made an appointment to see the physiotherapist the following day. He returned home in a state of some excitement to tell Mary the good news that the clinic was going to be able to help him. Mary was thrilled at the news and offered to take control of their menu planning immediately. She said she would be more than happy to share Paul's diet with him as it wouldn't hurt her to lose a pound or two. The next day Paul returned to the clinic for his appointment with Sally. She had him lie on her couch whilst she manipulated the muscles either side of his spine and applied some ultrasound treatment. Before he dressed, she handed him an exercise sheet and went through the various exercises with him until she was satisfied he could do them properly. Promising to do his exercises every day, Paul left and went home. In his absence Mary had prepared lunch. It wasn't what he was used to and he pulled a sour face. You can stop that, said Mary, if a diet is going to help improve your mobility, a little abstinence now will more than pay off in the future. Paul had to agree with her and sat down to his meager salad. The next few weeks became a familiar pattern. Every Wednesday Paul visited the clinic for a session with Sally in morning and evening he scrupulously went through his exercise regimen. The diet was working also. Although he did not enjoy the restriction as to what he could eat and drink, Paul had to admit he was feeling better as the pounds fell away. Unfortunately, although feeling quite a bit better in himself, Paul's posture wasn't really improving. One day, after he had been attending the clinic for about six weeks Alice asked to see him after his session with Sally. She explained that it was going to take quite a long time to restore the balance in his musculature through exercise, but that there were a couple of shortcuts which could help move things forward. These techniques are a bit unorthodox, Alice explained and you might be too embarrassed to try them. However, I can promise you that they have worked for other clients of ours. I'm ready to try anything, blurted out Paul. I really want to get mobile again, and as soon as possible. Very well, smiled Alice. Here is what I want you to do. We need to stop your back arching so much and to that end I want you to start wearing either a corset or a high-waisted girdle. This caused Paul to blink. And then, continued Alice, we need to adjust the way you walk. This will require you to wear high-heeled shoes for much of the time. Are you serious? inquired Paul. What you are describing sounds as though you want me to start wearing certain ladies' garments. Exactly so, responded Alice. Female clothing is designed to help a woman make the best of her figure and posture in a way that men's isn't. I can promise you that this change will have a definite beneficial effect on your mobility, but I did warn you that you might be too embarrassed to try it. No, no, stammered Paul, I'll do it. It is just that it comes as a bit of a shock that's all. Good for you, said Alice with a smile. I suggest your wife comes with you for your next appointment and we can explain to her exactly what you are going to need, it would be too much to expect you to walk into a ladies lingerie shop on your own and buy these garments for yourself. Paul went home in a daze. 
Somehow or other he managed to explain to Mary what Alice had recommended. Mary burst out laughing. I'm proud of you for having had the courage to go along with her proposal. A lot of men would have bottled out. And Dr. Jones is right you know, properly fitted foundation garments do help a woman hold herself straight and heels ensure you are never sloppy about the way you walk. For the next week Paul was even more meticulous than usual in his exercise routine in the hope that by the following Wednesday he would have improved sufficiently that the wearing of foundation garments and heels would no longer be necessary. But it was not to be, Mary accompanied him to his weekly appointment and the two of them were shown into Alice's office. Paul is really doing very well, she told Mary and with this additional discipline I am confident we will see improvement in his mobility within the next couple of months. She then went on to explain to Mary exactly the type of garments she was recommending. Paul tried to follow their conversation but soon became lost in the welter of strange words such as stays, crisscross panels, kitten heels, and so forth. Eventually the two ladies came to the end of their discussion. I suggest we pass on any manipulation for today, said Alice. Why don't the two of you get off into town and sort out Paul's new clothes? As they got into their car, Mary said she knew exactly where to go to buy the things they needed and directed Paul to a small shopping precinct on the other side of town. When they had parked and Paul had, reluctantly, dragged himself out of the car, Mary led him towards a small discreet shop displaying elegant underwear in the window. The things here are more expensive than in the chain stores, she explained, but they will measure you properly to ensure the correct fit and that is vitally important if you are to get the benefit from wearing them. They entered the shop and a middle-aged woman approached them with a friendly smile. Can I help you? she inquired. To spare Paul's blushes, Mary explained why they had come and what they needed. Oh, that's not a problem, the sales assistant replied. We get quite a number of referrals from the clinic and a number of them are men, like your husband, with severe posture problems. Now let's get him measured and sized. Then we can find some garments for him to try on. Paul and Mary were shown into a changing room where, to his embarrassment, he was required to strip to his underpants and socks. The assistant, however, was totally professional, taking a whole range of measurements, waist, chest, height, torso to leg ratio, breadth of shoulder. For the life of him, Paul couldn't understand why so many measurements were necessary, but he went along with the process in as good a humor as he could muster. Eventually, the assistant seemed to have all the information she needed. I think we will start with a boned corset, she announced and went off to the stockroom to find a few options. When she returned Paul blanched at the sight of the satin and lace garments in her arms, surely he wasn't going to be expected to wear anything as feminine as that. But yes he was, and in next to no time he found himself being encased in the heavily boned garment. The assistant fastened the busk at the front and carefully adjusted the position of the corset on his torso. She then vanished behind him and started to tighten the lacing. At first the feeling of support for his tummy and back was very pleasant and Paul started to think this might not be as bad as he had anticipated. Then the assistant asked him to breath out and, as he did so, pulled the lace in tightly. Paul gasped, that is much too tight, he exclaimed. Nonsense, was the reply we have hardly started yet. She continued to tighten the corset until he could only breathe from the upper part of his diaphragm. He had to admit, however, that he was standing more erect and his nagging back pain was much reduced. I think that will do for the present, said the assistant. Later, when he becomes more used to wearing it, the corset can be tightened quite a bit further. Mary acknowledged she could see what she would have to do to help Paul into the garment. To his great relief, the assistant then proceeded to loosen the laces and remove the corset. This is the correct fitting, she said. I suggest you buy three of them, one in white, one black, and one in beige. That way you can coordinate them with your outer garments and lessen the chance of them being visible. Mary said she could see the sense in that and, accordingly, three corsets were set aside on the counter. Now I think we should look at some girdles and corselets, announced the assistant. 
Matching her actions to her words, she sped off to the stockroom and returned with another armful of underwear. Paul was soon learning the difference between body shapers, open-bottomed girdles, all-in-ones, and other designs that totally confused him. He found himself climbing into and out of one garment after another until, at last, the two women seemed to have settled on an appropriate selection. There is just one problem, announced the assistant. He can't really wear his regular underpants under these garments, they bunch up too much. I totally agree, echoed Mary. Do you have any plain panties that would do the trick? Of course we do, was the inevitable reply and all too soon Paul was the proud possessor of a pile of nylon and liquor knickers in a variety of tones from black to nude. The assistant even slipped in a couple of pairs of lacy, brightly colored panties, just in case the two of you feel a bit frisky, she announced with a grin to the blushing Mary. Paul did not know where to put his face. Eventually, the two women agreed that Paul had sufficient undergarments to be getting on with and the assistant rang them through the till. There was quite a large pile and Paul was appalled at the price. He paid, however, without demur. All he wanted to do now was get out of the shop. As they exited the shop he breathed a deep sigh of relief and set off for the exit. Where do you think you are going? demanded Mary. We still have to buy you some heeled shoes. Paul groaned inwardly but allowed himself to be led further into the mall until Mary spotted the shoe shop she was looking for. Once again Paul had to stand in embarrassed silence while Mary explained what they were looking for. I think a pair of black court shoes with three-inch heels to start with, must marry, something quite plain with a chunky heel as he isn't used to wearing heels yet. Paul did not like the yet. And maybe a pair of boots with a similar heel, they will provide a bit more support to his calves as he is relearning how to walk. The assistant hurried away and returned with a number of shoe boxes. Paul had to remove his shoes and socks and slip on a nylon stocking in order to try on the shoes. The first time he tried to stand he thought he was going to break his ankle, but, after a few tottering passes up and down the store, he started to find some equilibrium. He was made to try on several pairs of shoes before Mary declared herself satisfied. At the last minute she added a pair of ivory-colored mules to the pile, for the evenings when we don't want you wearing outdoor shoes upstairs, she announced. Paul blanched, he hadn't envisaged having to wear heels outside the house. At long last Paul and Mary headed home. Paul felt exhausted by all he had experienced during the shopping trip. He just hoped it would be worth it and that the wearing of these embarrassing clothes would help him regain a proper posture. No sooner had the two of them got indoors, but Mary turned to Paul, now go upstairs and change into a set of your new underclothes, she instructed. You are going to need to wear them at every possible opportunity in order to gain the benefit of adjusting your posture alignment. As this will be your first time wearing them, I suggest you start with one of the high-waist girdles, a corset might be too uncomfortable for sitting around the house this evening. Paul went upstairs and took a white girdle out of its wrapping. Looking at it closely for the first time, it seemed a formidable garment. Reluctantly, he divested himself of his clothes and stepped into the girdle. Fortunately, he remembered, just in time, that he couldn't wear his regular underpants, so he quickly stepped out of it again and opened a packet of panties. He deliberately chose the plainest pair he could find but still, as he pulled them up, he found he had to carefully tuck his penis back between his legs in order to make them fit. It all felt a bit bunched up, down there, but he reckoned he could experiment with finding the most comfortable arrangement when he had a bit more time. With the panties in place he, once again, stepped into the girdle. It proved harder than he would have anticipated to pull it into place and, even when he had got correctly aligned, the hooks, eyes, and zips too a lot of working out. Eventually, after a bit of a struggle, everything seemed to be in place. As Paul relaxed, he noticed, immediately, that the ache in his back was much reduced and that he was standing up straighter. Maybe this is going to work after all, he thought. If so it will be worth the expense and embarrassment. He then sat down to put on his new court shoes. As they were brand new and hadn't been worn outside, he didn't think Mary would complain about his wearing them indoors on this occasion. 
As he sat his girdle started to ride up at the front in an uncomfortable way. He also discovered that his feet would not slide into the shoes easily. He tried again with his socks on, but this was worse, his feet were now too large to fit into the shoe at all. He called down to Mary for help. As she entered their bedroom she smiled quietly to herself to see how Paul was struggling. You can't wear those shoes with ordinary socks, she announced, you are going to have to wear a nylon pair. She went to fetch a pair of knee-his from her bureau, but Paul interrupted her. I've also got this problem with the bottom of the girdle, he grumbled, it won't stay in place. In that case, Mary replied we will try something else which should solve both problems at once. She handed him a pair of regular nylon stockings. Put these on and fasten the welts to the suspender clips on your girdle, she instructed. The tension will keep your girdle in place and the nylon will enable you to fit into your shoes. Mary demonstrated to Paul how to roll the stocking into a donut shape and slip it over his toes before rolling it up his leg. With a bit of effort Paul managed to fasten the front clips, after all he had unfastened enough when making out with girlfriends in his youth, but failed totally with the ones at the rear. Eventually Mary took pity on him and helped him get his stocking taut and correctly adjusted. Paul now found his shoes slipped uneasily and, with care, rose to his feet and took a few tentative steps across the room. Mary was pleased with the way Paul was prepared to make an effort with his new clothing and praised him for the way he was managing to walk in his unaccustomed heels. In a few minutes Paul was happily and confidently striding around the room, inordinately proud of his new achievement. Mary sat looking at him with a quizzical look on her face. You actually have very good legs, she must and, wearing the heels, your calves and ankles make a lovely line. It's just a shame about all the hair. However, if you're game I think we can do something about that tomorrow. For now just put on your pajamas and dressing gown and come downstairs. Paul did so and soon the two of them were sitting in the lounge sharing a bottle of wine, as they did most evenings. Mary was amazed at how easily Paul seemed to be adapting to the new clothing. It was a bit incongruous to see his heeled feet emerging from the legs of his PJs and a naughty thought entered her mind. I wonder how he would look in a pretty nightdress and robe, she thought, and filed the idea away for future consideration. When it came time for bed, Mary helped Paul divest himself of his unfamiliar clothes and they curled up together under the covers. You know, said Paul I think this might just work. This is the least pain I have had at bedtime since I can't remember when. Well done dear, sighed Mary, leaning across and kissing him. Keep up the good work and, hopefully, we can bring you back from the brink and get you moving more easily again. It would be lovely if you could join me in some of my activities. After all that is what we had planned for our retirement and it had been a great sadness to me that you haven't been able to join in. I will try, promised Paul, if willpower and commitment can make it happen, I'll wear these female clothes with pleasure. The next morning Mary woke before Paul and, slipping quietly out of bed, went and found an aerosol of Nair in the bathroom. When Paul awoke she showed it to him. If you are going to wear nylons regularly you will find them much more comfortable if you remove the hair from your legs. Paul was initially a bit reluctant, but Mary pleaded and persuaded and eventually he gave in. Clapping her hands with excitement, she led him into the bathroom and helped Paul apply the cream over all his legs. He was a bit surprised when Mary continued the application above the stocking line and over his bum, balls, and lower belly. However he assumed she knew what she was doing and said nothing. Now I'll leave it on for a few minutes, instructed Mary. When you start to feel your legs get hot, get in the shower and make sure you wash the cream off thoroughly. Paul did as he was told and watched with amazement as the hair fell from his legs into the trap of the shower. So much hair came off that he had to clean the trap afterwards to avoid it becoming blocked. Mary was delighted with the newly clean Paul and assisted him in rubbing in a moisturizer to soothe his skin. She then handed him a clean pair of panties and laced him into one of the new corsets. This will hold you more upright than the girdle, she announced. Wear it today and you can change into the girdle for the evening. 
As the corset doesn't have its own clips for stockings, you can either wear a separate suspender belt or try pantyhose. I suggest the latter as we haven't bought a belt in your size and I'm not sure any of mine will fit. Paul agreed to Mary's suggestion and was then introduced to the contortions required to put on a pair of pantyhose. Eventually, he was properly clad from the waist down and had to admit the hose felt wonderful over his newly hairless legs. Secretly, he rather liked the way his legs looked wearing the sheer, dark brown hose. He pulled a casual shirt over his head and selected a pair of corduroy trousers from his wardrobe. It was only when he put his feet into his black heels that it became apparent that he was dressed somewhat differently to most men. Mary had a round of golf scheduled, so went off to meet her friends. Paul pottered around the house. He was amazed at how much easier and less painful it was to do odd jobs now that his back was properly supported and his legs forced into a less bent position. By the time Mary came home Paul had prepared a light lunch, something he hadn't done for months. Mary was secretly delighted to notice that the signs of constant pain she had seen in his eyes had almost disappeared. The next few days continued in a similar vein, Mary would go off to her various activities with friends whilst Paul did odd jogs around the house. As he became more accustomed to wearing feminine undergarments and the pain in his back and legs lessened, Paul found he had more energy than previously and started looking around for other jobs to do so as to use his time productively. Before long he had virtually taken over Mary's role as housekeeper. He cleaned the house, did the laundry, cooked meals, all whilst wearing his corsets and heels. The only thing he asked Mary to do was the shopping, he didn't want to take any risks of his unconventional attire being discovered. Paul continued his weekly physiotherapy sessions with Sally and she was enthusiastic about the progress he was making. However, he noticed that whilst he was walking with a straighter back, he was still allowing his shoulders to slump and she knew that until this habit was broken, his spinal alignment would remain out of kilter. Sally asked Alice's advice after one of her sessions with Paul and, the next time he was in the clinic, Alice asked to see him. She explained Sally's concern and said, My advice is that you start wearing a back support to pull your shoulders into alignment. I would suggest a well-fitted bra should do the trick. As he was now accustomed to wearing girdles, nylons and heels, Paul was less shocked by her suggestion than he might have been previously and, accordingly, later that day he and Mary made another trip to the lingerie shop in the mall. The same assistant attended them and, having expressed her understanding of Paul's problem, ushered the two of them into a dressing room and proceeded to take yet another set of Paul's body measurements. It took quite a long time to establish the precise size and style of bra that best addressed Paul's condition, but eventually they found a few garments that pulled his shoulders back in a very satisfactory manner. Unfortunately, in pulling his shoulders back, they also pushed his chest out. As a result of his diet Paul had lost quite a bit of weight and the effect of the bra was to force his sagging pectoral muscles into a semblance of breasts. I would estimate that naturally you are something like a 38B, must the assistant, but with your build, a C cup would be more appropriate. A padded bra and a couple of chicken fillets will give you a lovely profile. But I don't want a feminine profile, screamed Paul in horror. I was only joking, said the assistant in an attempt to calm him down. It is just you have developed such a feminine way of moving and holding yourself since I saw you last, that I thought you might enjoy taking things a bit further. Many of my gentlemen customers do, you know. Mary, sensing Paul's increasing distress, hastened to complete the purchase of his new bras and hurried him out of the shop. She did not say much on the drive home and studiously avoided any mention of breasts or bras. However, once they were safely indoors and she had poured them both a stiff drink, she did tentatively broach the subject. You will be wearing your new bras around the house, dear, she started. It is unavoidable that the constriction on your chest will force your spare flesh into a faux bosom and you will be much more comfortable if the cups are properly filled and don't sag and crumple. I will be the only one to see you and, as you know, I rather like your new upright posture. Do it for me, please? After a little more wheedling, Paul agreed to try on one of the new bras. 
Mary hastened to pass him one that was very plain, white with an underwired cup, but no lace or other overtly feminine decoration. She had to smile secretly to herself, here she was trying to find an unfeminine, bra for her husband to wear, when the very garment screamed womanliness. Eventually she had Paul securely fitted into his new bra and, delicately, she slid the silicon enhancements that she had purchased at the last minute into the cups and adjusted Paul's chest flesh into the semblance of a very realistic pair of breasts. She looked on with pleasure as Paul, clad only in bra, girdle, panties, nylons and heels sashayed around the room. You know, you do have a very good figure now that you have lost some weight, she must allowed, and I would kill to have legs as shapely as yours. Will you indulge me just for this evening? What are you proposing? responded Paul cautiously. Oh nothing much, replied Sally. It is just that I would love to see those gorgeous legs of yours descending from the hem of a pretty dress or skirt. No way, exploded Paul. Come on, Mary wheedled, it's only for me, and just this once. Grumbling, Paul finally acquiesced and, with a squeal of delight, Mary hurried to her wardrobe and pulled out a short-sleeved, shirt dress in a pale yellow, adorned with a print of small flowers. It was an old dress that was now too big for her since she had lost weight and she reckoned it would be just about right for Paul. Without giving him too much time to examine the dress, she pulled it over his head, helped him locate the armholes, and settled the dress down into place. The hem fell just above Paul's knees and, with his tan nylons and black three-inch heels, his legs did look fabulous. Mary could hardly contain her excitement. Having got this far, and your appearance so far exceeding my expectations, please let me go a little further, she begged. Reluctantly Paul agreed. Reluctantly, maybe a bit too strong a term. Secretly Paul had been amazed at his image as reflected in the mirror. From the neck down he saw the figure of a reasonably slim, shapely woman. He guessed what further steps Mary had in mind and, whilst his masculine pride required him to object vigorously, deep down he too wanted to see how he would look when fully feminized. Mary led Paul to her vanity and sat him down with his back to the mirror. She got out her makeup bag and proceeded to apply foundation to his face. Once powdered down, this was followed by eyeshadow and liner, mascara, blusher, and lipstick. She fitted an old mid-brown wig she hadn't worn in years on his head and carefully teased the hair into an attractive style. A simple pair of clip-on earrings, a necklace, and a bangle completed Paul's ensemble and, pausing only to give him a quick squirt of her favorite perfume, Mary turned his face to the mirror. Paul's jaw literally dropped. The face he saw in the mirror was that of an attractive middle-aged lady. Mary's skillful transformation had shed years from his apparent age and he now looked about his same as she did, namely late forties early fifties. I can't believe it, he stammered. Is that really me? Yes dear, responded Mary, with an affectionate smile. I told you I thought you would look good if you let me go all the way. And you do! In a daze Paul allowed Mary to lead him back to the lounge, where she poured them both another drink. Mary smiled in amusement when she noticed that Paul, in sitting down, automatically smoothed his skirt under his bottom. Please stay like this until bedtime, she pleaded. You look fantastic and I want time to enjoy my new girlfriend. Paul was decidedly less reluctant than earlier when he gave his agreement. The two of them spent a very pleasant evening sitting side by side on the sofa holding hands and swapping the odd kiss and cuddle, something they had got out of the habit of during the last few years of their marriage. Eventually Mary rose, took Paul by the hand and led him up to their bedroom. There they gently undressed each other until, clad only in their bras, girdles, and nylons, they gently made love. Both found the sensation of breast pressing against breast and nylon-clad legs slithering together, extremely erotic and they experienced a bout of lovemaking the like of which they hadn't enjoyed for a very long time. When they eventually collapsed in a warm glow of exhaustion, Mary helped Paul out of his remaining undergarments and, without consulting him, passed across one of her long nightdresses for him to put on. He slipped into the silky garment without a murmur and soon the two lovers were drifting off to sleep, wrapped in each other's arms, and each wearing a pretty nightdress with little spaghetti straps. 
The next morning Paul awoke with a start from a very realistic dream. He had felt he was being attacked by a vicious furry monster and, on waking, discovered his face was totally covered by the displaced wig which he had omitted to remove the previous night. Hair had got into his mouth and, pulling the wig free he hastened to the bathroom to get rid of the bits in his mouth. Having rinsed out his mouth and removed the strands of hair, he looked up and saw his reflection in the mirror. Although badly smudged, the remains of his makeup still gave him a very feminine appearance. Not knowing how to remove the makeup, he cleaned his teeth, took a pee, sitting down as it was easier to manipulate the nightdress this way, and returned to the bedroom. By now Mary was awake. Good morning, dear, she greeted him with a beaming smile. I trust you slept as well as I did. Paul told her about being attacked by the furry monster and they both had a good laugh. Mary went downstairs and brought them both up a tray of tea. She then showed Paul how to remove his makeup safely, using various products from her kit. My makeup isn't quite right for you, she must. Your coloring is somewhat darker than mine and you need stronger colors. What do you mean, stronger colors? said Paul. I'm not going to wear makeup again, am I? Well, that is up to you, dear, smiled Mary, but you have to admit you did look pretty good last night and our lovemaking did hit a higher plane than we have achieved for years. Grumpily, Paul had to agree that she was right. Well, maybe for special occasions when we both feel randy, he conceded. Darling, if you look as good as you did last night, I will feel randy all the time, exclaimed Mary. Now come here and give me another good seeing to. Needless to say the two of them were rather late rising that morning. When he did finally emerge, Paul pulled on a high-waisted panty girdle and a pair of black tights. He looked at his bra, his bra lying on the chair and with at least a show of reluctance, slid his arms through the straps. Mary, still lying in bed, was secretly delighted to see that, with a bit of fumbling, Paul managed to fasten the clasps without any help. Paul did not replace the breast forms and Mary, wisely, decided to say nothing. The previous evening Paul had shown that, in the right circumstances, he could be relaxed whilst fully made over as a woman and give rein to the female side of his personality. It was better to let things take their course slowly and not try to push him beyond the point at which he was comfortable to go himself. Paul selected a pair of blue cord trousers and stropped polo shirt from his male wardrobe, but did remember to slip on a pair of black, heeled pumps. His attire might be somewhat eccentric but it was certainly helping get rid of his aches and pains. The two of them spent the morning pottering around the house. Over lunch Mary decided to raise the stakes a little. You know dear, she started now that you can move around so much more easily, it is a shame that you are confined to the house. You would really benefit from a walk in the sun. I'd love to, replied Paul but you know that if I stop wearing my girdles, bra and heels my posture would relax back into its old pattern and all my pain would come back. Then why not go out wearing your heels and underwear? I know you don't want to be embarrassed in front of our neighbors by being seen wearing women's clothing, but if last night is anything to go by we could easily disguise you as someone else. Because you have remained indoors for so many weeks, none of our neighbors has seen the new, trim, upright you. They will remember an old, stooped man and will never connect him with a vibrant, upright woman fully twenty years his junior. You mean you are suggesting I go out pretending to be a woman, exclaimed Paul, his voice rising. Yes, dear, replied Mary calmly. I could easily introduce you as my sister-in-law, Paul's sister Pauline. Go on, what do you say? At the very least it will be a unique experience for you and we can pretend Paul is undergoing treatment in a residential clinic and that Pauline has come over to keep me company whilst he is away. Well it would be nice to get out, grumbled Paul but this does seem a bit extreme. I know, said Mary, sensing an opening, why don't we go to a beauty parlor that offers services to the transgendered and get them to give you a professional makeover. It would be worth the expense and, if they can convince you that you could pass in public, well, goodbye Paul, hello Pauline, at least for the next few weeks. The discussion went on for quite some time, but eventually Paul agreed to give it a try. 
Excitedly, Mary went online on their computer and searched the internet for a suitable beauty parlor. She found one that sounded promising in a town about 20 miles away that sounded ideal as it was highly unlikely they would bump into anyone they knew. So she rang the parlor and made a booking for the following afternoon. She didn't want to give Paul time to change his mind. The next afternoon, after lunch, Mary drove the car up to their front door and Paul hurriedly jumped into the front seat. To be honest, this was all a bit unnecessary as a thick jumper and heavy trousers had any sign of his female undergarments and, for this trip, he had swapped nylons and heels for socks and trainers. By the time they had driven the 20 miles Paul was in a high state of anxiety, but he allowed himself to be coaxed out of the car and into the shop. There they were greeted by a charming woman who introduced herself as Sylvia and the owner of the beauty parlor. She was personally going to see to Paul's makeover. Sylvia led Paul and Mary into a private cubicle, much to Paul's relief, he certainly didn't want to be transformed in full view of everyone who came into the shop. Sylvia explained the process she proposed to adopt for Paul. First he would have a full body waxing to remove any residual body hair. Mary smiled secretly to herself, pleased that Paul would start to learn of the pain and inconvenience women put themselves through in order to look their best. Next Paul would be fitted with a flesh-colored gaff to hold his masculine parts in check. Then he would be given a manicure and pedicure, before being fitted with a wig. She would then do his makeup, using colors appropriate to his flesh tones and new hair. All of this would take at least three hours, so she suggested Mary might like to spend a bit of time looking around the shops until Paul was ready. Paul wasn't keen to be left on his own, but Mary chided him for being silly. Secretly she was delighted to have the chance to go shopping as this would enable her to pick the first few items for Pauline's wardrobe. She exchanged a wink of understanding with Sylvia, kissed Paul goodbye, and hurried off. Now down to work, announced Sylvia. I know you are wearing female undergarments under that jumper and trousers, so there is no need for either of us to be embarrassed. I want you to strip off completely and then put on these, she passed him a pair of paper panties. Whilst she went off to collect her equipment, Paul stripped off and quickly pulled up the paper panties. He lay down on a padded table and pulled a sheet over his body. Sylvia returned, laden down with tubes, jars, spatulas, and tape. Good, she said I see you are all ready for me. She then proceeded to give him a full body waxing. Fortunately, thanks to his shaving regime, Paul didn't have too much body hair, but that which he did have clearly didn't want to leave his body, the pain as they were wrenched out brought tears to his eyes. Sylvia had given him a painkiller before starting the waxing and, after a while, the pain lessened and a sort of numbness took its place. Eventually Sylvia declared herself finished. You did well, she said. I have had many male clients who made much more fuss than you. Paul felt an odd sense of pride at the little compliment. If you remember to remove any regrowth from your legs and underarm with a lady's razor whilst bathing, Sylvia continued, you shouldn't need to come back for another waxing for about six weeks or so. Paul immediately determined to avoid another waxing for as long as possible, not realizing that in so doing he had tacitly agreed to adopt a standard female practice. As she had outlined at the start of the session, Sylvia next passed Paul a skimpy flesh-colored garment. This was the gaff she had mentioned and, eventually, after a lot of grunting and heaving and a little discreet assistance from Sylvia, Paul managed to get it on. His testicles had been pushed up into his abdomen and his penis was tucked firmly back between his legs. He now presented a smooth flat front down there, with no trace of his masculine equipment visible. It all felt a bit uncomfortable, but Sylvia assured him that he would soon get used to wear a gaff. You will need to wear a fresh one every day, she told him, so I put a packet of five aside for you. Having got the basics sorted out, Sylvia handed Paul loose white, cotton gown and sat him down in a chair in front of a large mirror rimmed with light bulbs. We need plenty of light for this next bit, explained Sylvia. I will explain each step of the process as I go through it and I want you to take note of what I say and do, as you will have to replicate it at home from now on. We will start with the wig. 
Mary showed me the one you wore the other evening but, to be frank, the color isn't right for you and it is too young, a style for a mature woman of your years. Now, what was your natural hair color before you went gray? Paul explained that his hair had been a mid-brown with a touch of auburn. Sylvia proceeded to take a number of swatches of hair from a cupboard and lined them up in front of Paul. Which one is closest to what you remember? she asked. Paul studied them carefully and eventually pointed at one. As best as I can recall, I was that color, he said. Sylvia called in an assistant and asked her to bring in a number of wigs in that particular shade. She reeled of a list of style numbers. These are all wigs that should work with your facial structure, she said, and we can set the one we finally choose in a style appropriate to the image you want to present. The assistant returned with five wigs on their stands and Sylvia tried one after another on Paul's head, having first fitted him with a nylon wig cap. Paul couldn't totally follow what she was doing, although even he could see that a couple of the wigs looked just that, whilst the other three did appear to be growing naturally from his head. Eventually Sylvia decided on one particular model and she, and the assistant, spent some considerable time teasing it into different styles. Finally she announced, yes this is definitely the one for you. Tanya, the assistant, will now take it away and style it whilst I continue with your makeup. Tanya gathered up all the wigs and left the cubicle to work on the selected one. Sylvia then called out for June, another assistant, to come and give Paul a manicure and pedicure. Whilst June busied herself with his hands and feet, softening the nails in bowls of warm water before trimming and shaping them, Sylvia started to apply foundation to Paul's face. She explained the importance of ensuring that the correct foundation was used as this would be the basis against which all the other elements would be applied. For men this even more vital, she explained. Your skin is rougher than a woman's and, of course, there is the problem of beard shadow to overcome. We need to find a product that provides good coverage but doesn't stand out. The ideal result is if appears that you aren't using foundation at all. She tried various colors of foundation. To Paul's untutored eye they all seemed very similar but clearly Sylvia could detect differences. She finally pronounced herself satisfied and applied powder with a large brush to set the foundation as a base from which to apply the other products. The eyes were next and Sylvia explained how the use of different colored eyeshadow could change a person's whole look. She also told Paul that she would be giving him a daytime makeup at the end of the session but that before that she would show him how to create a more dramatic effect for evening wear. Paul had had no idea a woman's life was so complicated and his head started to spin. Sylvia smiled and told him to calm down. With a bit of practice it's not too difficult, she laughed. After all 50% of the population put on makeup every day, and that's not just women. She started by saying, first of all I am going to have to shape your eyebrows a little. They aren't as bushy as many men of your age, but they do need some tidying up. I won't give you a pencil thin line, just a fairly androgynous look. The next few minutes were taken up with plucking and tweezing, Paul was amazed at the difference it made in his appearance, particularly after Sylvia had defined their shape with an eyebrow pencil. Sylvia next set out a palette of different colored as shadow powders. She explained that with his coloring, Paul was best suited to browns, purples and pinks, with green as a possibility if he wanted to emphasize the auburn tones in his hair. A very pale pink powder was applied first, just under his brow line. A darker tone went onto the eyelids before a purple shade was used to deepen the corner of his eye. A thin, flat brush was used to apply black powder immediately above and below his eyelashes and then he was told to close his eyes while Sylvia carefully used liquid eyeliner to emphasize the overall effect. She then brushed mascara onto both his upper and lower lashes. Finally she took a pair of false eyelashes and, applying glue, carefully affixed them to his upper eyelid. You would only wear these with an evening makeup, she explained. If you wore them during the day, the effect would merely be to make you look cheap. Of course you might want to play around with different looks, and I know of many men who enjoy bringing out their tardy side. Paul kept very quiet and made no comment. The next stage was to highlight Paul's facial structure with a little blusher. 
You have very good bones, Sylvia must. I know many women who would envy you your high cheekbones. The final remaining task was to apply lipstick and the Sylvia did, first outlining Paul's lips with a pencil, drawing the line slightly outside his real profile so as to give him the appearance of having fuller lips than he actually did. Once satisfied with the outline, Sylvia used a brush to apply a plum shade of lipstick. She sealed this with a little lip gloss and, finally, declared herself finished. The tones I have used really suit your coloring, Sylvia said, and the shade of lipstick is a perfect match for your nails varnish. Paul had been concentrating so hard on following what Sylvia was doing to his face he had totally forgotten about poor June, slaving away over his hands and feet. He lifted one hand to see what she had done. His nails were beautiful. They had been shaped into a smooth curve, the cuticles had been trimmed and cleaned, and the final piece de resistance, they now glowed with a deep pink-slash-purple sheen. It was an astonishing transformation, he could hardly believe that it was his own hand he was looking at. He shifted his gaze to his feet, swinging one leg into view, his toenails had similarly been transformed. He stammered out his thanks to June who smiled, gathered up her paraphernalia, and left the cubicle, just as Tanya was returning with his dressed wig. Sylvia swung Paul's chair round so that his back was to the mirror. She busied herself fitting the wig, titivating and primping until she was totally satisfied with the result. Just on last thing, she announced as Paul felt a sudden sharp pain in his left earlobe. He guessed immediately what was happening but before he could open his mouth to protest, there was a similar stab in his right ear and with a resigned grimace Paul realized that he would not be restricted to wearing clip-on earrings. Now you can look at the finished product, announced Sylvia, as she turned the chair back to face the mirror. Paul's jaw dropped as he saw his reflection, that wasn't him staring back in wide-eyed shock. What he saw was a sophisticated woman, dressed in a white towel and gown, with a pink, nylon makeup cape round her shoulders. Flawlessly made up for an evening out, her crowning glory was her beautiful deep brunette hair with gorgeous auburn highlights. It was swept up onto the crown of her head and pinned back at the sides, revealing two small gold studs in her ears, which were crying out to be replaced with a pair of long, glittery, drop earrings. I know that is me, Paul finally managed to stammer but I would never have believed it if I hadn't sat here watching you transform me. Sylvia smiled, so you agree that if you can't recognize yourself, there is very little likelihood anyone else would be able to do so? I think I have made Mary's point. Now, beautiful as you are, Sylvia continued, this makeup is not appropriate for daytime use so first I am going to show you how to remove it and then you can show me what you have learned by putting on your own daytime makeup. I will, of course, guide and help you get it right, but the sooner you start practicing yourself, the better. She then proceeded to remove all the makeup she had so laboriously applied, explaining the function of the various products she used as she went along. In spite of himself Paul could not help feeling a pang of regret as the lovely vision was gradually stripped away and his old, boring face once again took its place. The next hour was spent while Paul practiced putting on his own makeup. Sylvia was endlessly patient, wiping away areas that had gone wrong and giving tips about how best to apply the various products. Gradually Paul's efforts improved until, finally, Sylvia declared herself satisfied for a first attempt. While they had been working, Tanya had taken away the first wig and replaced it with another of the same color and style, but dressed for daytime use. One advantage you have over us real girls is that you can change your hairstyle immediately just by swapping wigs, whereas we have to spend hours getting it right, smiled Sylvia. She carefully fitted the new wig onto Paul's head and, once again, the attractive, middle-aged woman gazed back at him from the mirror. No longer glamorous and sophisticated, she was still clearly all women, and Paul knew he couldn't argue that he would immediately be spotted as an imposter if he were to go out in public looking as he did. Sylvia left Paul alone whilst he stripped off the dressing gown and putting on his, by now accustomed underwear. Not wanting to spoil the image by getting into his jumper and cords, he put the dressing gown back on and was just about to call out for Sylvia when Mary burst into the cubicle, her arms heavy with packages and bags. Where is she? 
Let me see Pauline, Mary cried out with excitement. As she saw Paul she stopped dead and her jaw dropped. I suspected you would look good and have no trouble passing as a woman, she gasped, but Sylvia had exceeded my wildest expectations, I can't believe it's you. She dropped her parcels and gave him a big hug. I can't kiss you as I don't want to smear your lipstick, she laughed. Now let's get you properly dressed. Paul undid the cord to the dressing gown and allowed it to fall to the floor. He stood there in plain white, long line bra, cotton panties and a high-waisted, open-bottom girdle. From the neck up he looked all women, but his bra sagged flatly on his chest. First off, you he to get a bosom, Mary laughed, handing him his silicon inserts. He slipped into the cups of his bra and pulled his own loose chest flesh into place until he had the semblance of a real bosom and displayed a quite respectable cleavage. As you are wearing a girdle with suspender tabs, I think stockings rather than tights, said Mary, opening a packet of barely black, sheer stockings. Paul rolled them up his legs and carefully attached them to the suspender clips. The stocking were too lovely to risk laddering. Next Mary took a full-length slip from a bag. It was generously trimmed with lace at the bosom and hem. She slid it over Paul's head, taking care not to muss his hair. She helped tug it into place before opening yet another package and passing him a long-sleeved, silk blouse. The basic color was purple, but it was decorated with a print of flowers in a variety of tones. It had a boat-shaped neckline and the sleeves fell loosely before being gathered into a tightly fitting cuff. Paul eagerly slipped it on and struggled slightly with the unfamiliar buttons on the wrong side before getting it done up. He was somewhat surprised about how attracted he was to the pretty garment but rationalized his feelings by thinking, in for a penny, in for a pound. Whilst he had been doing up the blouse, Mary had got out a plain purple skirt. Knee-length, it fitted smoothly over his hips and had a small box pleat down the front. It was a very appropriate skirt for a middle-aged woman to wear. Finally Mary produced his old pair of black, patent court shoes. I thought we would need these, she laughed so I put them in the car before you got in. Paul slipped his nylon-clad feet into his shoes and turned to face the mirror. Yes, the person looking back at him would definitely a woman and would attract no second glossé other than one of secret admiration. From anyone who saw her in public. You win, dear, he sighed. I guess Sister Pauline is going to be your house guest for the next few days. Mary flung herself into his, her, arms and hugged her. Thank you for being so reasonable, she said. I half thought you would lose your nerve and bottle out, I am so glad you didn't. I have hated the fact that you have been confined to the house these last few weeks. We can now openly go out together with any fear of you being embarrassed. There are just a couple of final adornments you need. She fastened a simple pendant necklace with an amethyst stone around his neck and a bracelet of amethyst beads on his right wrist. A gold lady's watch was fastened on his left wrist. As soon as your ear piercings have healed, Mary commented, we can go shopping for earrings. A quick squirt of perfume and Mary declared Pauline, complete. Now come and introduce yourself properly to Sylvia, Tanya and June who have done so much to bring Pauline into existence. Somewhat tentatively Paul stepped out of the cubicle. The three girls were waiting just outside. They all started to clap as he emerged. You have transformed wonderfully, gushed Sylvia. I can honestly say you are one of our most successful clients. You will have no trouble passing in public. Just one piece of advice, get Mary to work on your voice a bit. You already speak in a fairly high register but need to practice feminine terms and expressions, then you will be able to take your rightful place in any company. Paul thanked them all profusely and added a generous tip to the bill. He and Mary then left and drove to the shopping center where they had purchased his undergarments. Needless to say their first port of call was the lingerie shop. The same assistant was on duty and she squealed with delight as they came through the door. I knew you would make a lovely woman if you were prepared to go the whole way. And you do. I am so pleased you decided to let your feminine side out. 
Mary explained that Paul would be dressing 24-7 for a few weeks and would therefore need some more clothes. She inquired whether there were any items that would be suitable for Paul that were a bit prettier than the basic white ones he had at present. After all, she said we women all get pleasure in knowing that underneath our conservative dresses we are wearing something pretty and a bit racy. Well, replied the assistant we are a bit limited because Paul's underclothes need to be fairly substantial to give him the support he needs, but I will see what I can find. In the event she came up with three styles of bra, prettily decorated with lace and bows, some gorgeous silk French knickers, and a padded panty girdle that gave some shaping to his hips and derriere, to give you a better profile under a fitted skirt. They thanked her profusely and were about set off for their next destination when she made another suggestion. I would recommend that if you are planning to be female 24-7 for a number of weeks, you might be more comfortable with breast forms affixed to your chest, rather than the chicken fillets you have at present. Permanently fitted breasts will give you shape in a nightgown or a strapless bra. I don't actually sell such devices here, but I can direct you to a shop that does. Many of my gentlemen customers have purchased such items there. They thanked her and wrote down the address and telephone number she gave them. On leaving the lingerie store, they moved to a dress shop that specialized in styles for the more mature lady. There they purchased four-day dresses, three more skirts, a variety of tops and cardigans, and two elegant cotton nightdresses. Mary added a sexy, full-length silk one to the pile surreptitiously. And a cozy dressing gown. Mary even insisted that Paul buy two pairs of ladies' trousers. Most women wear them nowadays, she said. You would look out of place if you didn't wear a pair occasionally. They were just about finished shopping and were on their way to the cash desk to pay when Paul's eye was caught by a lovely, knee-length cocktail dress in a brilliant emerald green. Mary saw the way his eye had turned. That dress would really suit you, she said. It would set your coloring and hair off a treat. Normally shoulder straps that thin wouldn't work for women of our age, but this dress comes with a little jacket and that would work perfectly. If you like it, try it on. So Paul did and, as Mary had predicted, he looked really good in it. Mary insisted they buy it. I'm sure an occasion will arise during the next few weeks when you will need something dressy and it is better to get one now than have to rush around at the last minute. The fact that is on the reduced rack is a bit of a bonus too. Paul hadn't noticed this last fact and was delighted when he saw by how much the sale price had been reduced. The dress was immediately added to their pile. Next up was a shoe and bag shop where, in addition to a shoulder bag and two conventional handbags for daytime use, they found the perfect clutch purse to go with the new cocktail dress. They also managed to find a pair of matching, green pumps. Mary insisted that Pauline would need several different styles of shoe and, once again, the pile of purchases grew rapidly. They then found a MAC outlet and purchased a basic makeup set in Paul's colors. I always try to use MAC products, said Mary. They are a bit more expensive than some others, but well worth the extra cost. Finally they entered a jewelry shop and had a great time picking out a few bracelets and necklaces that would go with Paul's new clothes. Mary insisted he also buy a number of pairs of earrings for pierced ears. It will only be a few days before you can wear them and no woman feels dressed unless she is wearing earrings. The two of them finally decided to call it a day and drove home exhausted but very pleased with what they had achieved. On the way they called in at the address they had been given for the shop that sold breast forms. Somewhat to their surprise this proved to be an establishment specializing in medical supplies. When they went in and explained what they wanted and who had given them the address, the woman in charge smiled and said, Of course I understand now. What you want is a pair of the breast forms we stock for women who have had a mastectomy. Quite a number of gentlemen come in wanting a pair of those. She swiftly measured Paul and said it is a bit irregular to be fitted for breasts after you have brought your bras. Normally we do things the other way round, but don't worry, and it's not a problem. Having established that Paul needed a 38B bosom, she found the appropriate forms and glued them securely to his chest. 
Paul was surprised at just how heavy they were and was grateful when, on putting his bra back on, his new breasts received the support they needed. On the way home in the car Paul thought to himself, I would never have anticipated having so much fun cross-dressing. This morning I went along with Mary a bit reluctantly because it seemed to be the only way I am going to be able to get out of the house, but now I am really looking forward to trying to be the best woman I can. They were both so tired that Mary only had time to get Paul to try on one of his new nightdress before the two of them collapsed into bed and quickly fell asleep. Paul was awakened by a smiling Mary proffering a welcome cup of tea. Come on sleepyhead, she scolded, it is half past eight and you need to wake up. Paul drank his tea and hurried into the bathroom for a pee and shower. Having peeled off his gaff he felt compelled, in some odd way, to seat on the toilet seat to relieve himself. Funny, he thought, never found it necessary to do that before. Still it felt right. After showering he returned the bedroom to find Mary already dressed. I have laid out some clothes for you, she announced. Paul looked at what she had chosen for him. There was one of his new, lacy bras, a padded panty girdle, dark brown tights, a pair of slacks and a matching tee top, a pretty cardigan, and a pair of low-heeled shoes. He raised his eyebrows as he said, Trousers? Is that a good idea? I am trying to pass as a woman and you put me back in trousers. As I said yesterday, Mary replied, nearly all women wear slacks when carrying out chores and you were off to the supermarket this morning to get some groceries. Paul blinked but was wise enough not to protest. He had known that sooner or later he would be expected to venture forth in his own neighborhood dressed as a woman, clearly it was going to be sooner. He dressed in his new clothes and sat down at Mary's vanity to put on his makeup. When he was finally satisfied he had done as good a job as he could, he carefully placed his daytime wig on his head and pinned it in place. When he went downstairs Mary had prepared a simple breakfast of fruit, muesli, and coffee. Well I won't get fat on this, he grumbled. Stop complaining, replied Mary. This has been your diet for the last month and will continue to be so for the foreseeable future, get used to it. She handed him a shopping list. We only need a few things, she said. I thought a supermarket would provide a safe environment for your first solo outing. You won't need to talk to anybody and no one really notices anyone else. They are too busy examining the shelves for bargains. Paul had to acknowledge that Mary's analysis was a good one and he picked up the car keys and set off for the nearby supermarket. As Mary had predicted he experienced no difficulties whatsoever and was soon on his way back to the car with a trolley full of loaded bags. When he got back home, he took the shopping out of the boot and headed for the kitchen, intending to put things away in the fridge and cupboards. As he approached the kitchen door, he heard voices in animated conversation. He paused, wondering how he could quietly make his escape. It was already too late, he heard Mary call out, Ah, Pauline, are you back already? Come and meet my friend Muriel Hopworth. Paul had no option but to continue into the kitchen with his hands full of shopping bags. Mary was sitting at the breakfast table alongside another woman who Paul recognized as one of Mary's friends whom he had occasionally said hi to. He put down the bags and, summoning a smile, turned to greet Muriel. This is my sister-in-law Pauline, said Mary. As I was explaining, Pauline has come to stay and keep me company whilst Paul is undergoing an intensive rehabilitation program at a clinic in the country. Paul shook Muriel's hand in a gentle, ladylike manner and said hello. He sat, joining the other two at the table. I'm so glad to meet you, said Muriel. Mary has been explaining how you have kindly offered to come and stay for as long as Paul is away. Paul turned and, with an ironic smile, said, well you know how convincing Mary can be. She made it abundantly clear that she wanted another woman here with her during Paul's absence. Mary returned his smile and, reaching out, to his hand in hers. Pauline and I have always been very close, she announced. Paul could not help noticing how Muriel's eyebrows rose on hearing that remark. Mary poured Pauline, a cup of coffee from the cafetiere that was sitting on the table and the three of them made desultory conversation for a few minutes. Then Muriel changed the conversation. 
I am so pleased that I caught you, she said, addressing Pauline. I called over to tell Mary that Irene Sparks, one of our regular bridge circle, has been called away suddenly to look after her aged mother and we are one short for our practice session this afternoon. Mary tells me that you used to play a lot of bridge, will you help us out by sitting in this afternoon? Paul spluttered inwardly, Mary was clearly setting him up for another adventure and he couldn't see any easy way he could refuse without causing embarrassment all round. It's been a long time since I played, he said, and I am very rusty. I wouldn't want to hold you back, nonsense, replied Muriel. I'm sure it will all come back to you in next to no time. Well, that's settled, I'll expect the two of you at my house at 2.30 sharp. So saying, she rose and took her farewells. That's another fine mess you have got me into, said Paul, unconsciously mimicking one of his favorite comics. You'll be fine, Mary reassured him. Come on, it will be fun and you did used to enjoy playing bridge before your back stopped you getting out and about. Paul had to agree and, after a light lunch, the two of them went upstairs to get changed. This is one occasion when trousers would be totally inappropriate. It's a skirt and heels for you my dear, said Mary. She helped Paul change into one of his new dresses and watched, smilingly, as he freshened his makeup and donned a pair of three-inch heels. She too smarted herself up and at 2.15 the two of them got into the car and set off for Muriel's house. Muriel greeted them at the door and showed them into her lounge. Two card tables were already set up and three other women were sitting around waiting for the party to be complete. Mary introduced Pauline to Anne, Christine, and Charlotte. We are just waiting for Carol and Helen. The ladies welcomed Pauline warmly, expressing their gratitude for having stood in at such short notice. After a few minutes Carol and Helen arrived together and the party was complete. Muriel suggested that as Pauline was insisting she was very much out of practice for playing bridge she should initially partner Mary. You know each other well, she said, so even if your bidding is a bit erratic, there is a better chance Mary will understand your hand better than the rest of us. Amid laughter, slightly forced on Pauline's part as she was very nervous that she would be outed, as man, they all sat down to play. Pauline and Mary were playing against Carol and Charlotte. Bidding started and Pauline quickly decided that, for these ladies, a pleasant social afternoon was more on the cards than a session of serious bridge. She started to relax and her confidence grew as she and Mary won the first couple of games, one of them on quite a tricky contract, perhaps she wasn't as rusty as she had thought. She also started to be more comfortable in her persona as Pauline. Neither Carol nor Charlotte gave any indication that they did not accept her as another woman. The afternoon passed very pleasantly and after a couple of hours of play the cards were put away and Muriel went to the kitchen from whence she returned with a trolley laden with neat little sandwiches and cakes. The ladies settled themselves comfortably on the sofas and easy chairs and tea was served. It soon became clear that this was the most important part of the afternoon as gossip about mutual friends and neighbors became the order of the day. Paul, as long-time married man, of course knew that this was par for the course whenever a group of ladies got together. What he had not been prepared for, however, was the frankness of their discussion. No reticence was shown in discussing the most intimate details about their friends. Mary, naturally, was fully engaged in the conversation but Paul sat quietly and tried not to look shocked at some of the more outrageous comments. After a few minutes catching up on the latest developments for their friends, Muriel turned to Pauline and drew her into the conversation. Of course you won't know any of the people we are talking about, she said. Pauline replied that Mary had mentioned one or two of the names but, no, she was not acquainted with any of the ladies directly. Muriel then started to ask Pauline about herself. Paul had to think fast. As Pauline was supposed to be his sister, he was able to talk about her, childhood using his own memories and feminizing them. It got trickier when the questioning turned to more recent times. Mary could see he was starting to struggle and jumped in to help him out. Paul and Pauline's father died quite a few years ago, she explained. 
By then Paul was married to me and we did think of inviting his mother to come and live with us. However, Pauline, very unselfishly, gave up her own career and returned home to look after her mother. When mother died last year Paul insisted that it was only right that Pauline should inherit the family house. I know Pauline feels embarrassed that she got most of the inheritance and doesn't like talking about it. Isn't that right, dear? Pauline nodded, keeping her eyes downcast. She was amazed, Mary had come up with a most plausible history for her. She rapidly got her brain in gear and was able to fill in with convincing detail as the other women expressed their admiration for her sacrifice and questioned her about caring for her mother. Eventually the tea party came to an end and everyone said their goodbyes. If Irene isn't back by next week, said Helen maybe you would be kind enough to step in again. The next bridge session will be at my house as we take turns to be hostess. Paul could see no polite way of refusing so said he would love to meet them all again. As they drove home Mary asked him how he felt the afternoon had gone. Well, as you could see, initially I was as nervous as anything, he started. Then we started playing and I really enjoyed that. The chat over tea was a bit nerve-wracking but you were brilliant in the way you helped me out when I was getting into deep water. Overall I'd say I enjoyed myself very much and it has been wonderful to get out of the house again. As you know, even before my joints started playing up, as Paul, I never really socialized much, so it has been fun chatting and gossiping, although I must say I was initially shocked by the frankness with which you all discussed your friends. Mary laughed, oh we women aren't all sugar and spice you know. I'm glad you had a good time and the fact you were there as a woman didn't seem to faze you too much. I was really impressed with the way you managed your skirt and heels when sitting and rising. I know, replied Paul, I have to confess that I quite enjoy the lightness and freedom of these clothes over the clumpy things I wear as a man and, after wearing heels and girdles for all these weeks, adding a skirt no longer seems that big a deal. Mary squealed with delight. I so hoped that would be your reaction, she said but I hardly dared think you would come to terms with becoming a woman so soon. We are going to have such fun for the next few weeks. On returning home the two of them sat and watched the television news before making a light supper. Neither bothered to change out of their pretty dresses and Mary was secretly pleased at the ease with which Paul was adapting to his new role. After washing up they watched a bit more television before retiring to bed. Pauline slipped into one of her new nightdresses and, to Mary's delight, sat down at the vanity to remove her makeup, using all the techniques Sylvia had taught her. The next morning Paul had a routine checkup appointment with Dr. Alice Jones. He decided there was no real option, he had to attend as Pauline. So, after showering, he put on a clean pair of panties and bra and carefully adjusted his silicon inserts to give him the appearance of cleavage. He pondered on what he should wear and decided that if he was going to the appointment presenting as a woman, he should do it properly and be as smart and elegant as he could. Eventually he settled on a dark green silk blouse and straight black skirt. In order to ensure these garments fitted properly, he knew he would have to wear one of his corsets and get Mary to tighten the laces as far as they would go. Mary was more than happy to oblige and it wasn't long before Pauline was critically examining her image in the full-length mirror. She saw a slim, attractive, mature woman, a little thick round the waist but still displaying womanly curves, a highly appropriate image for a lady of her years. Her gaze traveled from the top of her softly waved, brunette hair, over her silk blouse with a green stone necklace nestling at her throat, down across her fitted black skirt, to her black tights and patent leather heels. She looked every inch the mature lady she pretended to be. She checked the contents of her new handbag and accepted the loan of a light coat from Mary. You look lovely, Mary enthused, giving her a kiss on the cheek, but taking care not to mess Pauline's makeup. I'm sure Alice will be very impressed with you. But won't she be shocked that I am presenting fully as a woman, worried Paul. After all the female undergarments were only meant to be a medical aid, not a new style of dressing. It will be fine, Mary reassured her. 
It is only natural that after wearing female underclothes and heels for all this time you should want to take the next logical step and see how you look fully made over, Dr. Jones will understand. Paul took a lot of care over his driving as he headed for the clinic. This was the first time he had been in the car on his own as a woman, Mary had always driven on previous outings and the last thing he wanted was to be pulled over by a police car. When he arrived at the clinic he told the receptionist that he had an appointment with Dr. Jones. Although he had dealt with the same receptionist on previous visits, he was impressed with the way she handled his new appearance. Please take a seat, she said Dr. Jones is just finishing with another patient and will be with you shortly. By the way, that is a gorgeous blouse. Paul smiled and thanked her, maybe it wasn't going to be too embarrassing after all. He only had to wait for a few minutes before being shown into Dr. Jones' office. Come in and sit down, said Alice. I can see from the way you are walking that your back, hips and knees are much improved. I also can't help noticing that you are looking extremely attractive today. I just love your outfit and new hairstyle. You aren't shocked that I am wearing women's clothing? inquired Paul. Not at all, responded Alice. You are by no means the first of my patients to have taken the next logical step after the experience of wearing women's underwear for several weeks. I find many men have a secret fascination with the female side of their personality and enjoy the opportunity to explore their feelings and the relative safety of a medical program. Now, take off your outer garments and let me take a better look at you moving around. Paul went behind a screen and removed his skirt and blouse. He actually felt less self-conscious parading about in front of Dr. Jones in his underwear than he did in a skirt. After all he had done this on previous visits to the clinic, Alice expressed herself pleased with his progress. Now strip down to your panties and lie on the couch, she instructed. I'll give you a hand with loosening the lacing on your corset. Paul removed the remainder of his clothing and lay face down on the couch whilst Alice manipulated his spine and joints. Alice was very impressed with the improvement in Paul's condition. In fact, she was of the opinion that Paul was ready to give up his supportive foundation garments and could revert to conventional masculine attire. She did not, however, verbalize her thoughts. It was clear to her that Paul was starting to gain real benefit from his exploration of his feminine side. When he had first become her patient he had been taciturn, only asking questions when asked, never volunteering information, and virtually never smiled. Pauline, on the other hand, was outgoing, friendly, smiled a lot, and was happy to engage in conversation. I think we will leave things as they are for a bit longer, she thought to herself. That's very encouraging, she told Paul, after she had finished her examination and he had got dressed. I think we can ease off on the more restrictive undergarments and see how you get on for the next few weeks. Of course, you may wish to keep wearing your corset for fashion purposes, it really does give you a very nice figure. Paul blushed but was secretly delighted with the compliment. He thanked Alice profusely for all her help and made an appointment to see her in a month's time. He drove home and, excitedly, relayed his news to Mary. She, in turn, was delighted that Pauline would be around for at least another month. The next couple of weeks saw the couple starting to settle into a new routine. It transpired that Irene Spark's mother would need her help for a number of weeks, so Pauline became a regular member of the bridge group. One day Mary took Paul to the golf range to see how his back would stand up to a golf swing. To their disappointment Paul immediately found that this was definitely not something he could do without causing himself considerable pain. They were both sad because this meant he would be unable to join her in playing golf and tennis and these sports would have provided him with further opportunities for getting out and about and meeting new people. Fortunately another avenue for socializing soon presented itself. The two of them were at Helen's taking tea and enjoying a gossip after a bridge session and Paul was explaining how his medical condition was limiting his social life. Why don't you join me at my flower arranging club? suggested Helen. I can't abide any form of sport so never join the others for those nasty games. You and I could have fun arranging flowers whilst they get all hot and sweaty. 
Flower arranging would definitely never have entered Paul's consciousness, but, as Pauline, it sounded perfectly appropriate and rather intriguing. He accepted Helen's suggestion with alacrity and the following Thursday afternoon went with her to her club. The other ladies present made him very welcome and, to his surprise, he found he had a knack for seeing how different blooms and colors could be combined in pleasing arrangements. The afternoon rushed by and Paul was pleased when he was invited to come back for the next meeting the following week. Whilst chatting to one of the ladies he met at the Flower Club, Paul discovered that they shared a mutual interest in modern Russian novels. As a result he was invited to accompany his new friend to her book club one evening. In this way Pauline's circle of friends rapidly increased and, interestingly, included a number of different women to those with whom Mary usually mixed. They both agreed that this broadening of their acquaintance was good for both of them. Paul could not remember a time when he had enjoyed so full or fun-packed social life. Whilst he had been busy running his business, there hadn't been the time for hobbies and pastimes and, since his retirement, his health, and a general sense of self-pity, had stopped him starting anything new. For the next few weeks life for Mary and Pauline was delightful. Mary was so grateful that Dr. Alice Jones' treatment seemed to have solved Paul's mobility issues and Pauline was a much more fun companion than Paul had been these many years past. She was secretly amazed at the ease with which Paul had adapted to a feminine life. It gave her much pleasure to see him laughing and chatting with his new women friends, discussing fashion and home furnishings and joining in the gossip about mutual acquaintances. He had even started to take an interest in cooking and was turning out to be a really competent baker. His cakes were much in demand at afternoon tea parties and for the occasional fate or church fundraiser. However, nothing remains perfect forever and, after a couple of months, they started to pick up rumors about themselves. These started with the odd question about Paul, and when was he coming home from his residential clinic? Two months seemed a very long time for such a course of treatment. Then they learned of gossip about their relationship, those two are much too close for sisters-in-law, and that sort of thing. Eventually one evening Mary sat Pauline down after supper, we need to talk seriously about how we are going to deal with these comments that are starting to circulate about us, she started, we can't just let things drift. How would you feel about reverting to your Paul, persona and allowing Pauline, to return to her own home? Paul's face fell. You know, he said I don't really want to go back to being Paul, I have never had so much fun in my life as I have enjoyed these past few weeks. I know dear, replied Mary sadly, it has been wonderful seeing the way you have blossomed and I really enjoy having you as my new girlfriend. And our sex life has improved enormously, it is almost like it was when we're first married. But we have to face up to the fact that things cannot continue as they are forever, we need to think this through and come up with a plan. Their conversation continued late into the night and a fair amount of white wine was consumed. Eventually they arrived at a way forward. It would not be an easy path to follow but they were both agreed that it was the best compromise to ensure they were able to retain those aspects of their life that were most important to them. So, at the next bridge afternoon, Mary took the bull by the horns. Ladies, she started, I have some sad and serious news I need to share with you. Their friends were immediately all ears. Paul has left me. I received a letter this morning informing me that he has set up home with a nurse he met in the clinic and is planning to start divorce proceedings. I can't say I am totally surprised. Things were not good between us before he went into the clinic and since then we have drifted further apart. His letters and phone calls have become fewer and fewer and he has always had some excuse why it wasn't convenient for me to visit him on any particular day. The ladies gathered around Mary, expressing their sorrow at this change in her affairs and offering their support. It isn't all bad news, said Mary eventually when the initial hubbub had quietened down. She reached out and took Pauline's hand in hers. As you may have noticed, Pauline and I are more than just friends. She has always been a lesbian and I enjoyed bisexual relationships before I met Paul. In short, we have decided to set up home together permanently. I hope you are not too shocked. There was a sharp indrawing of breath and, for a moment, the room went deathly quiet. 
Then Helen stood up and, crossing to Mary, gave her a big hug. She then did the same to Pauline. Well, I can't say I am too surprised, she exclaimed, and I am delighted for you both. May you be very happy together. The other women quickly echoed her comments and soon the room was full of excited chatter and laughter and not a few tears of joy. Pauline and Mary shyly showed the others their commitment rings which they had specially purchased the previous day. Their news was a five-day wonder. The gossip rapidly circulated around their circle of friends and whilst they did encounter the odds night remark, in the main everyone was very supportive. In fact, more than one lady took them aside to tell them how much she envied them their honesty. If I wasn't married I too would prefer to live with another woman, was the gist of their comments. So Mary and Pauline settled comfortably down into life as an apparently lesbian couple. Of course this course of action presented its own problems. There was the question of Pauline's legal status for a start. Her passport, investments, share of house ownership, etc. were all in Paul's name and, although ostensibly divorced, there was, of course, no legal basis for this position. Next they had to face up to Pauline's physical condition. If she were going to live the rest of her life as a woman she would need to grow her hair hour and stop wearing wigs. Should she replace her breast forms with implants? All sorts of questions flowed from there, seemingly simple, initial decision. But problems are there to be overcome and, for the time being, the happy couple was willing to shelve them and just enjoy their new relationship. They did eventually get round to addressing all these issues. But that is another story.